In this presentation, I'm going to go over Bruce Bueno de Mosquito's Crisis subgame. Now, I have to point out that this subgame was also part of work that Bueno de Mosquito did with David Lawman, most notably their book War and Reason. So, props to David Lawman as well. However, this Crisis subgame is also used in uh, Bruce's forecasting and is featured in uh, the Predictioneers game. And so, we're going to give, you know, we're going to call it Bruce's model here with always keep in mind, David Lawman has been involved as well. Okay, so it's a crisis subgame, but a subgame of what? In the book War and Reason, it's part of the larger international interaction game that Lawman and uh, Wayne Demoscrita work on there. And in Bruce's forecasting models, it's part of his broader negotiation game. And that game has a first stage, right? Both of those are the same game. They have a first stage where both players, A and B, choose whether to make a demand of the other one, right? And so this is the, 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 the pre-crisis stage where should I make a demand and, you know, someone can make a demand of, of the other player and the other player can go, yeah, sure, they can acquiesce to it. Uh, or they could say uh, no and make a counter demand. Right, and so we have D for demand A, demand B for the demands players make. When both players have made a demand and it's been rejected, right? Because player B can say, uh, no, I want you to do this. Player A can go, okay. <laughs> so, and player A can acquiesce as well, right? So we have that stage that has to be worked out. But when we've got two competing demands on the table, this is what Buena de Mesquita describes as a crisis, right? And so now we move on. And so uh, this crisis subgame is worth looking at in and of itself. And also, if you know how these things are solved through backward induction, it's worth, you know, getting this in, in hand will help us understand the larger game later. Okay, so in this model, we're just going to assume that player A is going first and player B is moving second. What is the crisis subgame? You know, well, what does it look like in extensive form? It starts with player A at node one, right? We've already got demands on the table. So now player A decides, do I fight or not fight? Now this would be, this labeling works if we're talking about war, about international interaction, right? And so this is a, a decision to fight or not fight. More generally, do I go into conflict, right? Do I do I contest this, right? So we could have conflict, not conflict. At the second node, player B moves and player B has a choice of fight, not fight as well. And if B chooses not to fight, then we go all the way down to our, our, our outcome of negotiate, right? So if there's demands on the table and both guys decide, yeah, we're not gonna fight over this, well, we're gonna negotiate, right? On the other hand, B could choose to fight, which would lead us to another node, which we'll get to in a minute, right? Node four. Let's look at the other side. At node number three, B, same decision, right? This is the same level of the game. A has made a move, A decides to fight. Well, now B has a choice, not fight or fight. And the outcomes associated with this are important, right? If A chooses to fight, and B chooses not to fight, we have a capitulation on the part of B, right? So it's cap B for capitulate B, right? And in that instance, A is good, you know, all right, I give up, right? A gets what it wants, right? Demand A is the outcome. However, B can choose to be Ukrainian and fight back, right? And say, oh, you know, oh hell no. Now we got a war A. Right, and war A means a war initiated by player A. And it makes a difference in the model whether or not the war is initiated by one player or the other, by the way. Getting back to node number four. Okay, here A chooses not to fight. B has chosen at node number two to fight. At node four, A has to decide, well, what are we gonna do now? 
right? And so we have little little f, right? The, the little the notation here of the lowercase fight, the not capitalized fight, means you're you're choosing to fight after already being attacked. So at this node, we, we very similar to node number three. Uh, a chooses uh, to, if it chooses not to fight, then it capitulates. So we have a capitulation on the part of A. Or if A chooses to fight, it fights a war started by B. So we have war B. That is the crisis sub game in extensive form. So let's go on and look at these outcomes in more detail as well as preferences over. Okay, so the outcomes here. There are five outcomes. Negotiate, right? Both parties negotiate. Now, the policy outcome, right? What's the payoff? What's what, what comes out of this? Generally, the idea is it's a compromise that saves the cost of fighting. And the idea is that the negotiations will be contextualized by the power relationship, the expectation. There's a um, Buena de Mesquita has a whole expected utility equation that it takes into account power and salience and what's at stake uh, and comes up with a prediction there. And the idea, though, is you, you basically get, in, in a nutshell, you basically get more or less the same outcome as if you fought. You just don't have everyone dead, right? Or you save the costs of the conflict. If it's not a fight, there are costs to engaging in a conflict with somebody and you save the costs with negotiation. Then the next outcome, cap A, capitulate. A capitulates, we end up, the outcome is an intervention, right? This is a one-sided military use of force, actually fairly common in international relations. Uh, and just think the US uh, inv quote unquote invasion of Haiti, the US started to invade, planes were in the air, Haitians said, whoa, okay, we give up. Now they had, they were talked into it a little bit, but uh, by the presence of Carter and uh, Colin Powell, but that's in a classic intervention, right? And the policy outcome is B gets what gets what it wants, right? A capitulates, B gets what gets what it wants. Um, we could talk about there being costs here, but eh, they, in the model, we simplify it. And this is the, the key thing is this is one of the few outcomes where we get a certain policy outcome. Now, war A, right? A war initiated by player A. Again, the policy is decided by conflict, but there are costs associated with fighting. The big difference between war A and war B is going to be the is modeled here as the level of cost. In general, the assumption is it's better to fight a war that you start. And now you could argue that that, you know, having the initiative and being able to move first goes into the probabilities of winning, right? In Bruce's models, he usually says, well, it's about the cost, right? If I go and fight on your land, it's the costs are greater to you than they are to me, right? And so, Arithmetically, it's about the same thing. I wouldn't get too hung up on it, although it might be something worth looking at. But the idea here is there are costs associated with war and that war initiated by A generally means lower cost to A and conversely higher cost to B. Then we have capitulate B. Okay, just the opposite of cap A. B, <laughs> B capitulates. A has an intervention. The policy outcome is A's demand. Finally, war B, same thing as with war A, just flip the script. War initiated by player B, policy again decided by the conflict with costs associated, right? So it's basically the same thing you get with negotiation, but with costs associated. And here the costs, because B initiates, the costs are assumed to be a bit lower. Now, what does this mean for preferences? Okay, we can say in this and generally now you can you can change these up and, and say well what if we get a different if you can make the argument right and a, like i say a lot of analysis goes into what you think the preference ordering is and you know discussion of one outcome being preferred over another the idea here and, and here i've got a little notation i'm sorry for each player i right so that's 
if, if we're talking about A, put A in all the I's and B in all the J's in this equation or this uh, inequality here. Uh, the idea is utility to each player, I, for their, their demand, getting what they want is the best, right? That's pretty, uh, that's all that says. Hey, getting what you want, best. Better than negotiating. Negotiating with the other guy is going to be, eh, you're going to have to compromise. But by assumption, uh, the way we think, we think the negotiations are contextualized by what you would expect to happen in the war. And they're, you know, for all players, the assumption is it's better to negotiate than to fight because you're going to get, basically, we expect the same outcome in the negotiation, but we're going to save the costs, right? So negotiation is better than both wars. And the assumption here is that it's better, you know, the ut expected utility, right? The EUs are expected utilities, right? Because we don't have a certain outcome. With a capitulation, uh, you get a certain outcome. Here, well, we're going to go through a process of either fighting or negotiating and something will come out. So we have an expectation ahead of time, though. And the expectation is that a war for each player I, a war initiated by that player is better than a war initiated by the other guy. So that's what we have by assumption of the model, right? Then we get this question, what about, how does each player feel about capitulating, about giving up? Especially with regard to the different war outcomes. I mean, sure, you would expect in a war, you can, you can win, right? You can get policy concessions, you can get a better outcome by fighting, right? If you capitulate, it's the worst possible outcome. Right. Presuming, presuming that you don't like the other guy's demand. Right. Uh, and that that band is the maximal thing that you have to give up. It's the worst policy outcome, but it saves you the cost of fighting. And this is the question. What's the trade off between getting better policy versus the cost of war, which are going to be, you know, a lot of factors are going to go into that. There's still a lot of analysis that you can do that's not mapped that goes into these things. Right. And we want to say, okay, what's the trade-off between policy and the cost of war? So let's look at a couple at the game and solve it with a couple hypotheticals here. Okay, let's start off, you know, right up here, what I've got, and for the next few slides, we're going to have the same thing. So we're solving the crisis subgame, given those are the assumptions, right, that uh, for each player, it's the best thing is the other guy capitulating and then negotiation, then war that that player starts, then war that the other player starts. But the question is, what about that player capitulating? So let's make a hawkish assumption. Let's just assume that for all players, they would prefer to fight. Even if the other guy starts it, they would prefer to fight rather than capitulate. So. To solve the game, we just start, we do backward induction. And at node number four, not fight, fight. It's a choice for player A between capitulating and fighting by our hawk assumption, right? We know they're gonna fight. Uh, when we go to node three, exact same situation. Uh, in that node, you've been attacked, you're deciding you're, the choice. The, it, actually, remember, it doesn't matter what happened before. We look down. It's cap B versus war A for player B, right? And we know by our Hawk assumption that war, you know, even though war A, A was started by the other, war was started by A, B prefers war over capitulation. And then if we continue on, we say, all right, at node two for player B, still B here, but uh, it's a choice between negotiate and war well negotiates better so b would like to not fight and at the beginning we put in node one and player a has a choice of not fight or fight and we just follow the arrows down that's a choice of negotiate or war a and we we know that players prefer to negotiate over fighting because at least they save the cost of fighting so boom there we go equilibrium outcome they don't fight this is the traditional rationalist prediction. Given complete information and the assumptions we've made about war, you know, the nature of negotiations, 
you know, there's this idea, hey, look, if you knew how the war was going to go out, and this is what the complete information is about, if both sides knew what the war was, right? I mean, there's still, by the way, uncertainty in this. We still have expected utilities. We still have probabilities. But if both sides make the same probability calculations, they'll say, look, the war is probably going to go this way. We can save the cost and come up with a deal that basically produces that outcome. And, you know, there's a little space for maneuver in there. There's a negotiation, a contract space. But we would get, you know, we should get an outcome that we, we could negotiate an outcome that would at least save us uh, the cost of fighting. And this is kind of a prisoner's dilemma type situation, right? That there's something that's better for both player, a Pareto efficient outcome. So this has often been the argument of rationalists that if war was, if we had complete information, we wouldn't have war. So put a pin in that for a second. We'll circle back around to what can happen in complete information. Now, moving on to our second situation. Let's, let's move cap. Let's move the utility for capitulation um, so that, hey, look, I would prefer, right, in, in this case, for each player, capitulation rank orders, it's, it's, it's worse than starting the war, right? We'll allow that if, hey, if I can strike first, cool. But if the other guy strikes first, I would rather just give up and avoid, you know, that. And so let's assume that it, you know, we could say there's some kind of universal first strike advantage so that even though you would be okay with fighting over giving up, if, if you could start it, the other guy, nah, not so much, right? So if the other guy starts it, you want to give up. Let's see what happens here. And so we go into node four and here we say, hey, by assumption, you know, that assumption we just put up there, you'd prefer to capitulate, right? So we're not going to fight. Same thing with player three, same decision. So player three will not fight. So both, uh, excuse me, at node three, player B will not fight. So both A and B will not fight here. Now let's see how that affects the game. At node two, B has a choice of not fight or fight. Fighting leads to capitulation on the other guy's side. Capi you know, the other guy giving up is better than negotiating. You know, why compromise when I can get the, you know, why take half a loaf when I can get the whole thing? So yeah, right. We're going to fight. If, if we, if the, if it gets there, player B is going to fight. Now player A's decision, we look and say, hey, look, at node one, player A can fight and if he fights, then player B will capitulate. It will not fight at node three. So that's what that side. And then player one going down to not fight. Player B, player A will not fight. Player B at two will fight. And we get down to cap A. Oh, yeah, we're going to fight. <laughs> player A. And this, now, you know, this makes sense, right? We've said there's a first strike advantage that's, that's written into the, that's implied in this preference ordering. Now it could, this preference ordering could come up in other ways, right? But given it, we have this, we have this first strike situation and yeah, you know, it's kind of intuitive, right? In that situation, whoever gets to move first wins and, you know, gets the other guy to capitulate. So, now this is intuitive and when you have an intuitive result it's nice that the game is able to you know you like to sometimes find things that make sense on the face of it because you like the game to reproduce reality right and so yes we're getting uh, results we should expect the question is do we have counterintuitive results can we discover counterintuitive things and that's what we're going to look at next year so wipe the hits <laughs> wipe the screen and go to this assumption. All right, let's make the assumption that we just made, right? That uh, for one player, and this time, and, and what we're gonna do here is we're, rather than saying everybody has the same preference already, what if there's a difference? What if player A would rather capitulate if attacked, right? But would still, if, if it gets a chance to attack, would prefer to fight a war on its own terms, but if the other guy, B, attacks first, better to capitulate. And then let's make the hawkish assumption that player B 
is just absolute, you know, it's better to fight either way, even at a disadvantage, than to capitulate. Okay, so now we have these two different assumptions. Let's look at what happens. At node four, now here we have to be careful about which player we're talking about. At node four, it's player A, and this is capitulate is better than fighting a war started by B. So player A at node four will not fight. Now at node three, player B is got a choice of capitulate war. And by the hawkish assumption, yeah, player B is going to fight. So we have differing outcomes depending on which path we go. So now at node number two, player B has a choice of not fight and get negotiations, fight and get capitulation by the other guy. Well, hell, you know, a full loaf is better than half. Now we have player A's, you know, the fun, we get the final piece of the puzzle here. Player A, if player A doesn't fight, player B will fight. And player A knows that if it lets B go first, that player A will capitulate at node four and get cap A. But if player A fights now, knows that B is going to fight back, we're going to get war A. But hey, war A is better than capitulating. Boom, we get war in full information. And this was actually, uh, you know, something of a, uh, a result that war occurs with full information. And largely it's a situation where A has failed to deter B, right? We can look at that. And these situations, given the empirical analysis that uh, Buena de Mesquita and Lallman did, they said, yeah, this actually kind of happens a lot. We get this uh, situation. And so their first counterintuitive thing here, uh, they have a lot more results in their book, but their counterintuitive result here is, hey, we can in fact have war with full information, right? So the rationalist idea was that war is always the product of some uncertainty. It's like, mm, no, we could have it occur if we get to this crisis subgame. Now they go on to talk about what happens at the previous stage, you know, and they say, well, usually you'll try to avoid this, but at the crisis game, we can in fact get conflict. So, hey, now it's been a long video uh, to go through these variations and that's the thing, when you get deep into these models, there's a lot of things to, to tease out. But this is the crisis subgame and gives you an idea of uh, what we've got. Again, the reference for this is uh, the big one where a lot of this is played out and it uh, is Buena de Mesquita and Lawman's 1992 War and Reason. A good book, lots of stuff to, uh, to look at in it.